Okay, I made some changes to my sound quality, so hopefully this is better for you guys. Um, let's just get on. Let's just get into it. The new studio progresses. Uh, three rule. I want to go over this. I know I did this in the last video, so if you listen to that video, if you suffered through the audio of that last video, this is just a repeat. Three rules. Uh, that we have three uh, things that we can do to make sure we have the Word of God. Three tests that we can apply to make sure we have the Word of God. Uh, first, before we get to the first rule, um, I think that it's important that we write, uh, that we have the correct philosophy. There's a prelude to these three. And that is, our job is not to test the Word of the Lord to see if we have the Word of the Lord. That's not our job. Our job is to receive the Word of the Lord and to deliver it to others. That's what we're commanded to in Scripture to do. We're not commanded to test the Word of the Lord. We're commanded to receive the Word of the Lord and to deliver the Word of the Lord. Okay? But I wanted to give you these three tests when the Word of the Lord is challenged. When somebody comes and says, Hey, the, long, the last 16 verses of Mark don't really belong in the Bible. Or the first 11 verses of uh, John 8 don't belong in the Bible. Or 1 John 5, 7 doesn't belong in the Bible. Matthew 18, 11, does, whatever. And there's, a, there's a lot of these. There's like 100, over 100 of them. When somebody comes and challenges us as to whether or not this belongs in the Bible, then I think we need to use, we can use these three simple tests to say, it does. It does, and we need to bend our mind to it instead of trying to fit it to our philosophy, okay? The first test is, has it always been in the Bible? Okay, has it always been in the Bible? And even if it's not in the extent scriptures that we have, I'm sorry, manuscripts that we have, the extent manuscripts, because their, their argument is they're only going to look at, it, at extent scriptures. What does that mean? Uh, extent manuscripts. What does that mean? That means ancient Greek manuscripts that still exist today. That's all they're going to consider. That's not the promise of the word. There's nothing in the Bible that says that's all we should be looking at. Okay? The, the, the Bible is delivered and preserved by God. That means it's preserved and it's going to be copied and it's going to be uh, received and delivered by other people. Received and delivered, received and delivered. Um, so when we look at, in the, we can go back and look at ancient Latin manuscripts and say, okay, they were copying the Bible and they're telling you the manuscript they were using to copy it. And yet we don't have that ancient Greek manuscript anymore because it's disintegrated. It's been used up. It's been handled too many times and, and, it, and we don't have it anymore. That's fine. But we have the Latin, okay, <laughs> dating all the way back to, you know, the 500, 500s, 5th century. 5th century would be 400s, 500s, I think. Is. And, and you can say, look, you know, here's, here's it. But, the, but they won't look at those because they're not in Greek. Why? They still are showing that whatever Greek Bible existed then had these passages in it because these are copies of that Bible. And you say, yeah, but they could have added those passages. So could the ones that they're using. See, the ones that they have, the, Vatican, the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, yeah, they could have added passages then too. So if we find a new by a new manuscript that's been buried for hundreds and or at this point thousands of years, over a thousand years, and it predates the Vatican and Sinaiticus, and it leaves out John three sixteen, does that mean we should leave out John three sixteen? You see, they're not claiming to have the originals. They're just claiming that their copies are better than our copies. But we're like, yeah, but we can go back and see that the church fathers were quoting. 1 John 5, 7, way back in the, in the early 300s, the late 200s. And, and you say, yeah, and that predates the Vallejanus and Sinaiticus. So whatever Bible the church had back then had 1 John 5, 7 in it. Because uh, Cyprius said, it is written, these three are one. The only place in the Bible that phrase appears is 1 John 5, 7. And these three are one. So the first test is, is it if somebody challenges you to say, hey, that, that really doesn't um, belong in your Bible, there's, there's a lot of questions around that, that scripture. Well, wait a minute, okay? Is that the, has the church always had this scripture? Is the, is the Bible that people were quoting from all the way back in the 200s, does it have that scripture? Yeah. 
the, the beginning of John, the first verses of John, this is where Jesus says, let ye without sin cast the first stone. That's been one of the most quoted scriptures of the Bible in all of history. And yet, no, that's not original. Even though we have all these quotes from it. Yeah, but it's not in the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, so... Okay. Um, has, has it always been in the Bible? Has the church always accepted it? And not just limited to extent manuscripts. Because th that's a moving target. That's something we can never know. Uh, a thousand years from now, if the Lord tarries, and we're still here in a thousand years, I'm sure there's going to be more manuscripts there. So maybe even the Vatican and Sinaiticus get destroyed in a bomb or fade away. If we don't have those extant manuscripts, we can't just trust copies. If we don't have the original manuscripts, then we can't... Well, they're no longer part of your calculations. <laughs> they can't, based on your philosophy. So what I'm saying is, no, what makes perfect sense and what, what, is, what the church has always done, by the way, all the scholars who have reproduced the Bible, they're like, what has the church always accepted as the Bible? What is, what is always, you know, what do all these copies say? It, it's more of a... I'm not a majority text guy, but it's more of a majority text that's way more accurate than the critical text. But it's more of a, what has the church had? What is credited here? Uh, because God has preserved his word by receiving and delivering. Two, the second test, is it true? I have the wrong passage pulled up. Just noticed it. Sorry, guys. Is it true? Is it, and what I mean by true, is it biblical? Is it supported biblically? Um, this is 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear witness. And the part that's highlighted is the part that's left out in the newer Bibles. The part that's disputed. Okay, so in answer of this, we can say, one, has it always been there? We can say, yes, that has always been there. Um, we, we, we can see Cyprian, uh, Cyprian quoting it from the uh, second century, late uh, well, late 200s. I get confused about the first and second. Late 200s. He's quoting it. And we can also see that it is true. It is biblical. Look at it. For these three bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. What are they agreeing to? They're agreeing to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay. So... Are these three one? Is this this Trinitarian statement supported in all the rest of the Bible? Well, oh, you know, see, they're not arguing that it's false because it's obviously true. They would have to argue against the Trinity to argue that this is not true. I don't know of any uh, biblical scholar that people, I mean, Bill Mounts, James White, Mark Ward, these people, I've never heard them argue that this passage is true. They just argue, James White says, if you believe this passage belongs in the Bible, you're a zealot. So, okay. <laughs> I've been called lots worse. Um, yeah, that's a true statement. This is a true passage. So, one, yeah, it's, it was in the Bibles uh, way before Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. Two, uh, we have Latin copies that verify that. We have Jerome writing that people are taking this passage out because they didn't like the, the we are one statement and we have uh, the church fathers quoting this passage all the way back in the late 200s that predate Vatican and Sinaiticus. so it's always been in the Bible two it's true three third test is it God's voice now this may sound like a subjective test but it is not it, it, it you can't remove this test like from the other two this test builds on itself in other words, does this sound like God? Because and, and, and you go, wait a minute, you know, well, there's lots of passages of them. Maybe you know, if you have a weird version of God in your head, that they're not. Maybe you believe that homosexuality is, is, is as long as two people love each other. Then what difference does it make? God is love. He He said we should love. There's no law against love. So yeah, that when it says that a man laying with a man is an abomination to God, that doesn't sound like God. This test isn't to be exclusive from the other two tests. Have we always had it? Yes, that passage about manling with another man. 
Is it abomination to God? Yes, that's always been in the Bible, okay? Uh, is it true? Yes, there are lots of passages in the Bible that talk about homosexuality as being an abomination or being morally wrong. And so then we get to the third test. And that is we have to say, look, we're going to pray about this and say, does this sound like the Bible? Because Jesus said, my sheep will know my voice. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to read each passage and say, does this sound like Jesus? Does this sound like Jesus? Maybe not. Maybe I shouldn't. No, 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 no. If the first two are true, the third should follow. In other words, this should sound like the voice of God. If this has always been in the Bible and it's biblically true, then 1 John 5, 7 sounds like God. Okay? Even, even if it wasn't originally written by John. Hear me out on this. Even if it wasn't originally written by John, it's still always been in the Bible. It is biblically true. It is true. It is true. The highest measure of true. It is true. And third, it sounds like God. It is his voice. So there is no reason to remove it. In fact, the opposite is true. That we should consider this the word of the Lord. That's the point of the third Test that we should that we should bend our own thinking to the word and not try to bend the word to our thinking. So these are the three tests, with the caveat that our job isn't to test the word. But these are maybe I should say these are the three responses when somebody tries to challenge the word of God. I mean, that's a better way of putting it. Three, uh, three responses to a challenge on whether uh, on a passage not being accurate. And this is so important because uh, I was, uh, the people that I, I follow, a lot of people that I disagree with, but a couple of the guys that I follow that I agree with a lot uh, is the Trinity Radio uh, guys. Um, Braxton Hunter is the, I think, the lead guy over there. Um, but his compadre, oh, what's his name? I think I, do I still have it up? I may still have it up. No, I don't have it up. Um... Oh yeah, I do right here. What's his name? This guy right here. If you, I don't know if you can see that. Where's uh, Jonathan Pritchett? That's what it is. So he, they were talking about um, women pastors because Jonathan Pritchett is actually an egalitarian, and he was talking about how uh, Rick Warren's arguments were weren't good ones, but yet he still, you know, he's saying they weren't good arguments because. Uh, Rick Warren said, well, yeah, women are commanded to preach in the Bible. But they're not, which is true, by the way. They are commanded to teach and preach. But it's the role of pastor that they are not, that which means elder, that they are not to have. Okay, the, the role of elder is, uh, is reserved for a man. Uh, that's not me saying that. I don't care. But the Lord, I mean, I care in the fact that the Lord cares. The Lord is the one that, that sets those rules, and that's what he uh, has said. So, uh, anyway, he was arguing against this. But he was saying that Rick Warren's arguments, because Rick Warren wants to change the SBC to be either egalitarian, which means women can preach, women can be preacher, women can hold the role of pastor, elder. Uh, and, and so he was saying, well, I'm elegant, but I don't agree with his arguments. And so I, saw, I was interested to hear what his arguments were. As I went over to watch that video, um, on it's called Ret Wretched Radio Extra, if you want to go check it out. And I said, what, you know, what are his reasoning? His reasoning was to bring up textual variants about uh, 1, Corinthians and, 1 Corinthians and Timothy. That was, that was his argument, to attack the word of the Lord, to attack biblical inerrancy. Um, 1 Corinthians 14 and, and 1 Timothy 2. Uh, he was going where the, where the Bible says that a woman shouldn't have hold a position of, uh, of eldership or a, a position of authority over a man. Uh, and to, uh, as he puts it, the, the women are told to shut up and go ask their husbands. When you, when you understand that passage, it's the role of the woman to hold the man accountable for the spiritual leadership of their family. When you, when you read it that way, when you understand, that's what, because if you take it in context, that's what he's saying. And it's not just women he tells to shut up. He tells a bunch of people to shut up in that passage because they're causing disunity within the church. Things aren't in order. And he says the church should be orderly because God is orderly, not confusion. 
So, you know, the prophecies, he says, shut up if you, you know, and, and speaking in tongues, if it's gibberish, tell them to shut up. And if women are causing, uh, asking a lot of questions uh, when they should be holding their men accountable uh, to be the spiritual leaders of the home, you know, tell them to shut up too. Right? But he didn't say shut up. He just said, you know, not, not in the context, the cultural context that we're saying it. He didn't say, like, shut up. He's saying, no, address your questions properly. Make your man find out. Make, your, make, make him, the spiritual leader of your home, find out and explain it to you. Um, hold him accountable, you know, for this. Anyway, um, I'm getting off on a different subject. The point is that he, to make his point, he attacks the word of the Lord. When anybody ever does this and say, well, the Bible really doesn't say that, that's a yellow flag. Wait a minute, what do you mean by that? Because there's some legitimate things, like in, in, in Ephesians, where there's this, um, where there is some stuff in Greek that's important to know in, in English. Um, when, when we look at this passage here, we can see that, hey, that word, that, is, and this word, uh, it, and that, are both gender neutral, which means they don't apply just to the word faith, because faith is feminine. Uh, and they're also plural, that and it are plural. And so they're referring to this passage. This, oh, actually that, I think that's plural and it is singular, but that means that they're referring to this whole thought right here. It, it means they're not referring just to the word faith. And that can be important to know when you're studying the passage because of things brought up in the culture today, right? Um, so what when it was originally written and translated, well, not originally written, but when it was originally translated to English, there was no easy way to carry that across, and it was unnecessary because nobody thought that that would apply to only faith. It, it, the way they read English then, they would have understood that it's talking about the process of salvation. It's talking about everything that came before the comma. But the way we read things today, because we're not as <laughs> English, because our English isn't as literate as it used to be, um, there are people that are making the point, and I've heard Calvinists do this, to say, hey, you know, faith is a gift of God. Look, it's only a gift of God in the sense that we're able to breathe. That's a gift of God. That we're able to move. That's a gift of God. Uh, and we're able to have faith. Yes, that's a gift of God. But the gift here that is being spoken about is the process, that by grace we are saved through faith. That is a gift of God. This, that we are saved is a gift of God through, uh, by grace, through faith. Okay. The whole thing, all of those things, those three things together, grace, saved, and uh, faith, is what the, that's referring to. So, I'm sorry, getting off on this, but my point is, is that just because somebody says, hey, let's dig into the Greek a little bit, that's, it's still a yellow flag. Wait, why? What's going on here? That should get your ears up. What are they trying to pull on me here? And then you, it's not necessarily a red flag, because in this case it's legitimate, but the way he brings it up to make it, if you're trying to, the way he brings it up to make his point about women, that this is, that this passage really doesn't belong there, that it's, I, I really even couldn't follow his logic, to be honest, because it was co so convoluted. It was confusing the word. And he makes another point in his video that I'm going to bring up now. My, my whole test thing is done, by the way. This is all extra. <laughs> the three responses to uh, three legitimate responses to a challenge to the word of the Lord. I'm done with that. He brings up another thing that maybe should be a separate video, but he talks about the fact that a hum hermeneutical point that we uh, that we all learned as laymen uh, just in church was that you let the clear passages uh, define the unclear. You don't let unclear things come back and change the clear passages, which is, to me, a major argument against Calvinism. Whosoever believes should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you just read that passage, it's very clear. To change that to say, well, whoever is given belief. Well, that's not what it says. <laughs> you know, so you, know, you don't let some uh, more confused passage in Romans 9, which says, no one is good, no, not one. Except it just said, wait a minute, no one is righteous, no, not one. It just said Abraham was righteous. So one is righteous, Abraham is righteous, but it was faith was credited to him as righteousness the same way righteousness is credited to us by our faith in Jesus Christ. So you have to take that in context, but it's not, you know, 
it, it doesn't get to overrule the clearer passages of whosoever believes. Or when Paul is asked by the jailer, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. These are very clear passages that shouldn't be overwritten by less clear passages. Instead, let's dig into those less clear passages because they will be made clear in the context of, 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 of what's being said there. Um, so he comes against that because it doesn't support his argument. Because the clear passages state not to let a woman ha uh, have the authority, that an elder should be a man. These are the clear passages, and so they don't support his argument. So he, of course, argues against them. I think that that is a very dangerous hermeneutic, because then that allows you to just twist the Bible to make it say whatever you want it to say. We should bend, my, this is my whole argument through all this preservation, preserve, the preserved word of God. We should bend our thinking to the word, and I need to do that too. There are passages in the Bible I'm still trying to bend my head to those passages, okay? And say, no, no, I'm, I must be, I, I completely understand it this way, but, the, but this, the Bible seems to be saying that I don't, so I know that's right. This, this is me. <laughs> you know, I know that's right, though. So bend your thinking, bend your mind, even if you don't understand it yet. Say, look, I, I don't understand this, but this is what the Bible says, so I'm going to go with it. I, you know, even if you are, uh, think that you're born this way or whatever, I mean, yeah, whatever this way might mean to you. But the Bible says this, and the Bible is delivered from God who loves me and who would never tell me to do something that is harmful. So even though I don't understand it, I need to just not follow my own desires and believe what the Bible says. And hold to that and, and, and just pray the Lord will give me understanding in the future to, to, you know, to make sense of it. Because we know this is true. We can't stand on our own. We, we, we can only stand on what we know is true, which is the word of the Lord. And we can't have that a moving bar. And that's why the preserved word is so important. You just can't have something you're going to stand on the rock, as Jesus described it, which is his words. Those who hear my words and believe them is like a man who builds his house on the rock, not the shifting sand of critical text theory. All right. Until next time, I hope that you've enjoyed the show. Hope that it helps. I hope it helps strengthen your belief in the word of the Lord and that it uh, builds your confidence in that what you read in the Bible is God's word.